Welcome back to the channel. We will continue today our conversation about the 3D printed models of vessels that we recorded in the Black Sea. And although I'm giving you examples, specific vessels from the Black Sea, this is simply because I happen to have them lying around the house. In reality, this can be used for any vessel in any period. Is there any practical advantage to these 3D uh, uh, printed models? Yes, not necessarily in the reconstruction of vessels and in the scientific study of vessels, but in communicating with both students and the general public. Uh, having something that you can hold in your hand like this and turn it and look at it and play with it in your hand is uh, quite useful. Upon the whole, humans are tactile. We like to touch, we like to see, we like to feel something and not just look at it on a screen. Absolutely, modern computers can do fantastic things and yet no one has beaten the physical object and that is true also for interpretation uh, material and as a jog to your memory. So if in the previous video we were talking about the vessels from the Ottoman period and down to the high middle ages, now we'll continue going back in time with these models. And uh, I would like to begin with this one to a large extent because this is a model that I am studying at the moment, that I am preparing for publication. It dates to the, ten, the very beginning of the 10th century, possibly late 9th century AD, so this is the height of the Byzantine period. In the Black Sea, this is a very interesting uh, period. It is the moment when the Eastern Roman Empire, otherwise known as Byzantium, is recovering its strength and it is on the uproar, so to speak. In the Balkans, most of the Balkans are, and what is today Romania, are controlled by the Bulgar Empire, the third largest and most powerful empire in the early Middle Ages. Farther to the north is the period in which is established and begins to rise to power the new Kievan Principality. So in this interesting period, the Black Sea is an active location for trade. Most, although the Bulgar Empire controls most of the Balkan Peninsula, significant towns on the coast, on the western shore of the Black Sea, are in, under the control of the Byzantines. For example, Mesembria, uh, Hiamus, Uzopu, and now and then even uh, Varna, Odessus would be. On the east side, the Crimean Peninsula is definitely an outpost of the Byzantine Empire. And with such outposts thrown all over the place, it is obvious that the navy, the fleet, sailing and ships and uh, maritime communications between the centers are of vital importance for all the stated uh, empires in this period. So this is the historical context in which we have to look at this model and this vessel. The ship itself lies at 96 meters depth and it was the only one from the Black Sea map to which divers descended, specifically Professor Jonathan Adams and a Swedish master uh, tech diver together with a filming crew that of course you can see in the documentary. The bow of the vessel is here to the left, you can see the stem lying in the mud, no longer in position. Over here and over here, you see the bow frames of the vessel. We have about three futtocks, three frames on each side of the vessel here. This, they have survived to their original height, and that is something really rare in maritime archaeology. In between them, we see a stack of three Y-shaped anchors. Similar anchors were found on the famous 11th century AD shipwreck from Turkey, the Serce Liman ship. In this case, there are only three, they are stacked together. Considering how neatly they continue to lie on top of each other, it is likely that at the time of the sinking, the anchors were tied together. Immediately behind them, right over here, we see remnants of timbers that may have formed once upon a time riding bits or something along these lines. And almost certainly there was a bulkhead separating 
with a bow platform, which collapsed as the vessel started disintegrating and separated the main part of the hull from the stern section. Farther aft, we see the mast, we see four posts here protruding and we see one vertical stanchion. Almost certainly this was part of the support structure for the Latin rigged mast. We still see similar structures on uh, vessels using Latin rigs in the Red Sea, on the Nile, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and of course in the Arab Seas. Farther aft, we have a pair, and I just broke off the second frame here, but in these two positions we have frames that also survive to their original height and in their right position. Between them, we see a transversal bulkhead, which separated the stern quarter of the vessel from the main uh, central hold of the vessel. We see two vertical stanchions that almost certainly were framing the door and back under the mud here in some places it is visible the sole of the cabin still, uh, still in position. Farther aft we see right over here darkening brown and buried into the mud a massive transversal beam beam that has a crown to it it has a carving here it is almost like a dovetail joint there it is far too wide to be a normal deck beam in this area, so the explanation for its existence has to be looked for somewhere else. And yes, obviously, I do have a suggestion what it is. Down here we see the stern post still lying in the mud. Elsewhere through the mud we see parts of the framing protruding. Here along the center line you see that the, let's call it a forecastle for a lack of a better word, you see two timbers right here and right here, paralleling the mast, parallel to the center line. They have notches on their upper faces and they're connecting the forecastle with this area. Almost certainly this is some sort of an access to um, hatch and in a moment I'll tell you why and how. I will show you how I came to that conclusion. Why is this ship so interesting when after all at the any couple Joan Pulak and Professor Chabash excavated 37 Byzantine wrecks. Before that, we have the Yasaada, we have the Serce Liman, we have the Bosburun wrecks. So it is not like we are lacking. More recently, Magan Mikhail B. B was excavated by Haifa University. So we have good 40, 41 Byzantine wrecks at least excavated. Admittedly, not all of them have a lot of ship structures surviving. This is far better than most uh, survival. But why is this unique? Why is it so eagerly awaited in the community uh, to be published finally? Mea culpa, mea maxima culpa for not having completed the publication yet. The reason is simple. This is the only vessel in which we have practically the entire rig surviving. And that is truly unique. We have the mast here and we have the upper parts part of the broken mast line across the stern of the vessel. And over here you see two of the parts of the huge Latin yard that the vessel would have carried out. This of course is telling us also something about the sequencing of the sinking of the ship and how it sank. But for that you wait to see the article on the publishing. This beam here is also unique. It has not survived on any of the other wrecks so far discovered that I mentioned above, but it does survive here. And the only possible service for this beam is to be part of the steering mechanism. As I showed you in the previous video, in the Middle Ages, ships in the Mediterranean world, and really even in the North Seas, did not have a centrally located rudder as modern vessels do. The earliest evidence for such a stern-hung rudder comes from Scandinavia and dates to 1180, roughly speaking, 89 to be exact, if, I, if memory serves me right. But in the Mediterranean, they continue to steer with what we can crudely call oars on the sides of the vessels. They're not really oars. They were not used as oars. They're quarter rudders, but there would be one on each side of the vessel. 
and that continued all the way to the beginning of the 15th century. No wreck so far has had survival of the steering mechanism. And this is where this particular Byzantine wreck is unique because we do have the beam and right over here we have also the shaft of one of the quarter rudders in position. So that is the value of this Byzantine wreck. We do not, I speak of it Byzantine because it is the period of high uh, of power of the Byzantine Empire, the recovery period of the empire. But we can't be 100% sure that really the ethnic background of the vessel is Byzantine. It just is the most likely. Continuing back in time, let's look at this. This is a vessel, fairly large in comparison with most of the others. Most of the ships, uh, the Byzantine wreck that I just showed you a moment ago is about 20 odd meters uh, long. This is a little bit larger. It dates to the fourth, uh, I'm sorry, it dates to the third century AD. In other words, the height of power of Rome in the Balkans. It is a massive vessel. It is quite well preserved. It is also in fairly shallow waters. It's only in about 97, 8 meters depth, just like the Byzantine wreck. But in some respects, it is even better preserved. Over here, you see the broken mast. Here is the, uh, the stump of the mast. Here to the left is the bow of the vessel. Obviously this to the right would be the stern of the ship. I will return to it because to me this is the most interesting part. So I'll leave it for dessert if you'll forgive me. In the bow we see the frames are also surviving fairly high. Planks have fallen off. This is notable fact. It implies that we already are moving away from the ancient style of shipbuilding, of entirely assembling the shell, that's to say the planking, before adding the frames. In this case, clearly, the frames, in, at least in the upper parts of the vessel, the planks were added after the frames were already in position, if they had fallen off. In other words, they were not fastened in mortis and tenon joinery. It is likely that the lower part of the hull was, but we do not know that for a fact because we have not excavated it. God willing, one day, perhaps. The front end of the vessel is completely filled with amphora. At least three different types of amphora were discovered here. Samples were raised with a toilet plunger, if you must know. One of the ingeniousness of our crew. You see, over here there is a beam. There is another through beam over here. By through beam, I mean that it protrudes through the sides of the vessel on the outside. And then, this is the central part of the vessel where we do not see any type of cargo. But if we have such a large collection of amphora in the bow, there must have been here something even heavier to compensate for the weight in the bow. It must be now covered by the mud and that's why it is not visible. Our pyramids did not include excavation, unfortunately, nor did our time or funding allow it. Over here we see two beams, also through beams, protruding quite significantly to the outside of the vessel. So what could they be? In a moment I'll show you what they are. We continue through the stern. We see that it was planked once upon a time with fore and aft oriented planks, as you would expect. And we see here, two beams on top of each other, and in both locations, here and here, on both quarters, we see round shafts of steering of the quarter rudders protruding and still held in place. The rest of the shaft, of course, and the rudder itself is buried down. So these beams are the ones around which the shaft of the oar rotated as the helmsman commanded it. Over here we see two longitudinal timbers that also are holding in place, are closing from side to side the shafts. Um, undoubtedly this uh, identical construction existed on this part. They continue forward and they would have butted and been fastened to the ends of these two beams. And also we see on these beams that planks were mounted here in this area, creating wings or platforms on the side of the vessel which, of course, is quite interesting detail. These two vessels here 
are very similar in date. This, of course, is the one that has received the most attention in the media. It has been shown in magazines, has been shown online, has been shown everywhere. It is essentially showing you a complete Roman vessel dating to the first century AD. It is practically intact, only the stem and the stern posts have fallen out, so the ship has opened up in the bow and in the stern. It is built out of softwood entirely. The mast, again, the 3D printed model has a broken mast, but original, it uh, survives to its original height with some of the spars running, lying right across it. Very interestingly, the quarter rudders are in position. And here I'll bring your attention to the fact that the tiller for the quarter rudder is parallel to the center line of the vessel. Quite an interesting fact. Looking at the central part of the hull, you see here is one of the beams, here is the other through beam. Two longitudinal timbers that are sandwiching the mast between them, forming the side arms of essentially mast partners. And they connect also ledges are connected from the sidewalks here the deck walks across to these, oh, really they are like gangplanks on both sides of the vessel. The central part of the hull would have been completely open. These ledges connect these two carlings, let's call them for a better word. And as ledges, they connect the sides to the carlings. So this means that almost certainly on these ledges, once upon a time, some kind of uh, soft cover was closing off the hold of the vessel. Whether it was oiled canvas or it was uh, made out of hides, we do not know. It has not survived. But this is an interesting little vessel. <clears throat> this one over here is of uh, the second century AD, and it is practically a sister ship to this one, except it is deeper buried into the bottom of the sea, slightly less well preserved. The structure over here, this, this central line structure of uh, closing the hold exists also here in exactly the same way, but in this case, it has collapsed inside. Unlike this mast, which is complete here, this one is broken and has split into three separate pieces that are still in uh, their proper position. The quarter rudder uh, construction is identical to this one. And these wrecks in a roundabout way return me back to the Byzantine. Because of this structure with these notched carlings that we find also on the Byzantine wrecks, this is why I'm reconstructing the Byzantine vessel to include a similar sort of closing for the main hatch. And ditto also the steering mechanism on the Byzantine wreck. So how does this connect to archaeology? How does it help us in the interpretation? Mostly, as I said, it helps with communicating what we are working. Um, it excites people to see them, to touch them, to turn them in their hands. From my point of view, however, there are some elements that once you have colored them, once you can start turning it into your hands, it does give me an um, impression of tactile connection with the original vessel that otherwise I would not have if I was looking only through the 3D models on the computer screen. Has it helped me? Yes, actually it has. Uh, some of the details of the quarter rudders emerge this way. Some of the interpretation of the central timbers emerge this way. So by all means, it is a useful tool. And besides, it is very useful when you're teaching students. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention. And I shall attempt to answer any and all questions that you may have. With this, I wish you a most wonderful day. And if you liked what you heard, what you saw, by all means, put likes, subscribe, ask your questions below. Thank you.